Global warming. This is something we know so much about, but who has heard about ocean deoxygenation? This is a major effect of global warming and is something we know relatively little about, probably because it cannot be seen by the naked eye. Since the 1950s, scientists have been recording a decrease in the oxygen concentration of the oceans worldwide. The decrease seen over the past half century has been only 2%. Only 2%? That's nothing. This doesn't sound like much, right? But even the smallest of differences can have a huge impact on marine organisms. What part do warmer waters play in ocean deoxygenation? Well, there are three main avenues. One, reduced oxygen solubility. Warm water favours oxygen to remain in a gaseous state. This means oxygen is less likely to dissolve into the water column and therefore less oxygen is available to marine organisms. Two, stratification of the water column. This leads to reduced transportation of oxygen-rich surface water to deeper areas, a process known as ventilation. Global warming directly enhances thermal stratification and, by greater ice melting and precipitation, the salinity differences between upper and lower ocean decrease. Consequently, they would no longer mix as much. And finally three, raised metabolic rate. Respiration happens at a faster pace, resulting in an increased demand for oxygen. Coastal waters also suffer as they are closer to industrial, agricultural and sewage discharges. These runoffs are rich in nutrients and therefore drive eutrophication, a process resulting in local oxygen depletion. Over the past 100 years, this has led to open ocean oxygen minimum zones expanding by an area as big as the EU. Wait a minute, hang on, Shion, there's not something not quite right with that map, can you just fix that please? No yeah. problem. Thanks, that's, ouch, ow, okay. Um, at the same time, the amount of hypoxic coastal sites have increased by a factor of nine. What does this mean for marine organisms? Well, hypoxic conditions reduce growth, survival, reproduction, effective immune responses, and visual ability. Organisms are forced to use the majority of their energy on vital processes, hence these trade-offs come to be. Since areas of well-oxygenated water are smaller and concentrated at the surface, suitable habitat for aerobes is reduced. Individuals all move to this oxygen-rich layer, leading to overcrowding. As a result, competition for food peaks. There is simply not enough to feed everyone and many species are driven towards extinction. On the bright side, hypoxia tolerant species thrive, however, they are in the minority. <coughs> oxygen depletion affects animals on a more subtle level too. Nutrient recycling relies on the activity of microbiota dwelling in the seabed. These microorganisms supply the whole food chain with minerals and essential nutrients that they derive from dead organic matter. Under hypoxic conditions, the biochemistry behind this process is altered. This is particularly concerning for key elements such as nitrogen, phosphorus and iron. When oxygen levels are lower, the anaerobic processes of denitrification and anamox occur, which consume great amounts of nitrogen. The depletion of nitrogen is problematic as it is fundamental for the building of proteins, amino acids and DNA. Its consumption triples when hypoxia and nutrient overabundance co-occur. Alarmingly, deoxygenation also boosts the output of iron and phosphorus from the sediment. As these elements reach surface waters, primary production skyrockets. The other trophic levels also increase in biomass, resulting in an unattainable oxygen demand across the entire system. This disruption of biochemical processes limits ecosystem energetics. As energy is channeled towards microbes, eukaryote biomass and diversity plummets. As a result of less diverse communities, the efficiency of ecosystem processes, such as pollutant removal, are reduced. And as if that wasn't concerning enough, anoxic conditions cause microbial production of methane and nitrous oxide, both very potent greenhouse gases. So deoxygenation in itself fuels the major driver of its existence, global warming. This is a deadly positive feedback.
Numerical models are used to project the effect of climate change and eutrophication on marine ecosystems. Current models project that oxygen loss will total a few percent by the end of the century, having dramatic biological effects. However, the exponential growth of the human population is making it very difficult for scientists to predict the true extent of deoxygenation in the future. Without action, the condition of the ocean will only worsen and eventually it will be humans who are severely suffering. That's messed up, yo, what can we do about it? So how can we reduce deoxygenation in our seas? Well, we need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions and nutrient loads being put into coastal waters. This can be done by minimising fossil fuel use, improving human sanitation and more efficiently using fertilisers. These steps will reduce ocean acidification and eutrophication, ultimately aiding in the fight against ocean deoxygenation. But climate change is still the biggest issue affecting the earth. Without education, further research, fundamental action and a deeper respect for our planet, things will never get better.